from the last video, which talked about half equations and putting them together and getting balanced full equations. What we're now going to look at is the application of these equations in electrochemical cells. Now, there are basically two types of electrochemical cell. There's the galvanic cell, which we know better as a battery. And there's the electrolytic cell, which is used in electrolysis that you also hopefully have heard of as well. The essential difference between the two is that in the galvanic cell, electricity is being produced from a chemical reaction. And in an electrolytic cell, we're using electricity to create a chemical reaction. In particular, electrolysis means using electricity to split. Lysis means to split a compound into its components. So this video will be all about the first type, the galvanic cells, the ones that generate electricity from a chemical reaction. And then the second video I will make will be about electrolytic cells. Okay, now probably the best way of explaining this to you is to give you an actual example. And many, many years ago, the very first ever galvanic cell involved zinc and copper reacting together. Now we know from our reactivity series, and we met in the earlier video, iron displacing copper from a copper solution. Zinc is even more reactive than iron. So zinc would do that same reaction and displace copper from a copper solution. However, we do not want a chemical reaction here. We don't want to produce chemical energy, which essentially is heat. We want to produce electrical energy. So we want the zinc and the copper ions to react together, but we can't put them in the same container because then we would simply get a displacement and chemical energy would be produced. We need to use those two reactions to produce ele electricity, which is effectively a flow of electrons. So what we're going to need to do is put them into separate containers. We're going to have a, we're going to put two beakers together. In the first one, we're going to put a zinc rod in to its ions. And in the second one, we're going to put a copper rod into its ions. Now then, in order for this to react with that, they clearly have to be connected together. So the first thing we do is to connect them through a wire. And if we put a voltmeter in between, we can register the voltage of this pair of half cells. Now, volts are electrical energy, just like joules are chemical energy. So this is going to register the energy change in this reaction. However, at the moment, there's a gap there. And of course, electricity can't flow unless the circuit is complete. So what we need now is something here. Let's do it in a different color. What we need here is something to complete the circuit. And that pink thing there represents something called a salt bridge. It literally is an ionic salt, which could be as simple as a piece of filter paper dipped into a solution of sodium chloride or another ionic salt. As long as it's got ions, it doesn't really matter what it is. That then goes into each solution and ions can travel in between through the salt bridge into both beakers. If we set that up, this is what is going to happen. Zinc being the more reactive of the two will turn into its ions. So zinc becomes Zn2 plus and two electrons and copper ions gain electrons to become copper. How does that work in practice? Well, when the zinc turns into zinc ions, the electrons it produces travel from the zinc rod through the voltmeter where they register a voltage reading. It's called an EMF, electromotive force. Then through and over to the copper electrode 
where copper ions in solution gain those electrons and become copper. So the zinc rod will simply get smaller and the copper rod will get bigger. Inside the salt bridge, we have electrons going this way and negative ions traveling this way to complete the circuit. So negative ions will travel in that direction. Sorry, negative ions, they're not electrons. <gasps> That is one thing they definitely are not, is, neg is electrons. Electrons cannot travel through anything other than wires or graphite. Electrons can't travel through a salt bridge. So negative ions will travel this way, and positive ions will travel in the other direction. So effectively, as zinc becomes zinc ions, and the zinc ions in here now build up, Whatever the anion was in there at the start, let's say it was zinc sulfate, you have to obviously counteract this surplus of zinc ions, and that's what the negative ions in the salt bridge are doing. They may be chloride ions or nitride ions, it doesn't matter what the negative ion is, as long as the pluses and minuses in here cancel each other out. Otherwise the solution would become charged, and you can't get charged solutions. On this side, copper ions are turning into copper. So positive ions are going from this side and now being replaced by positive ions coming in from the salt bridge, again keeping that solution electrically neutral. Some terms that you need to know. The zinc electrode, the one that gives up the electrons, the one that oxidation takes place, this is very important, this is oxidation. This is called the anode. So the anode is where oxidation takes place, and since electrons are being produced there, it will carry a negative charge. The electrode where reduction takes place is called the cathode. And since electrons are moving in that direction, the cathode is positively charged. That pretty much shows you how a galvanic cell works. Again, as I say, we know them better as batteries. And in every battery, there will be two reactions taking place. There will be a redox reaction taking place as one of the chemicals gets oxidized and the other chemical gets reduced. And the oxidation reduction reaction generates voltage, which is effectively electrical energy. In the data book, they will give you a chart of all the different half reactions. Again, as I've said to you before, by convention, they're all written as reductions in the forward direction. What you have to do is effectively change one of them to become an oxidation. So if you, for example, had these two here, you'd find zinc would be up here, copper down here, the zinc would have to go in the reverse direction, the copper would go in the forward direction. And what I tell my students is, the easiest way to remember that is the anti-clockwise rule. So if you find the two half equations, whichever two they might be, the top one will always have to go backwards and the lower one will always have to go forwards. Now the reason for that is, is basically because these values down the right here, which are called standard electrode potentials, they are, they are with reference to a standard hydrogen electrode, which you will see in the chart has a value of zero volts. All of the other values are with respect to the hydrogen electrode. Now, in the chart, you will see that this one here, zinc ions plus electrons giving zinc, is minus 0.76 of a volt. So if I reverse it, this becomes plus 0.76 of a volt. Copper 2 plus, plus electrons giving copper is going in the forward direction, as it is on the chart and that is plus 0.34 volts. Therefore, the EMF of this under standard conditions will be 
0 0.76 plus 0 0.34, so the EMF, as they call it, for this will be 1.10 volts. All right, now there are different ways of doing this. My personal recommendation, the easiest way to do it, is whichever reaction is higher up, reverse it, which means changing the sign of its standard electropotential, and then adding it to the other one to give the overall voltage. So I showed you how to work out the EMF of the cell using the so-called anti-clockwise rule, that's probably something I've dubbed, um, where find the two half reactions, the upper one goes backwards, the lower one goes forwards, change the sign of the upper one, keep the sign of the lower one, add them together. There is another way of working out the EMF of the cell, and that's using a formula. I don't particularly like it, but to do that, you have to write a cell diagram. Now, in the last one, I drew a cell diagram showing you the zinc and copper half cells and the electrons flowing from the zinc to the copper and the salt bridge and all that. There is a, an accepted convention where you can actually show that in a, a sort of shorthand way. So if I was doing that same combination of half cells, this is what the cell diagram would look like. You start with the reducing agent, which is zinc, and you put a line between it and what it becomes. You then put a double line to represent the salt bridge, and then the copper iron becoming reduced to copper. So what this reads now is zinc turns into zinc ions, copper ions become copper. If you do that, then the E of the cell uh, that little circle, by the way, is used to represent standard conditions, which in this case would be 25 degrees C, atmospheric pressure, and all solutions, one mole per liter. So all of the values, by the way, in the data book are under standard conditions. So if you do this, then it's the standard electropotential of the right-hand cell minus the standard electropotential of the left-hand cell. Now the right hand cell is copper 2 plus giving copper and if you look that up its value is 0 0.34 volts. Take from that the value of the zinc. Now don't worry about the fact that it's been changed round. If you use this method to work out the EMF you use the value that's given to you in the data book. Now the value for the zinc is minus 0.76. So if I now do the maths, we have 0 0.34, two minuses make a plus, and then the overall voltage becomes 1.1 volt, which of course is exactly the same as it was using the other method. So what I'm suggesting is that if you do it yourself, you change the sign before you add them together. If you do it using the formula, the negative sign there changes the sign for you. You're going to get the same answer regardless. Some people prefer to do it this way, some people prefer to do it using the anti-clockwise rule. You can choose what works for you. They're going to give you the right result either way. Still on the subject of the electrochemical cells, there's one other kind of question that they could ask you. They could ask you uh, something like, will this chemical react with that chemical? For example, they could turn around and say, will zinc react with hydrochloric acid? Now we can use that chart on page 10 to work that out. First thing you have to realize is, what is the possible reaction that could take place here? Well, there's only one thing that can happen to zinc, and that is it can turn into zinc ions. There's no other option for it. Metals can never gain electrons, they're always going to lose electrons. Metals are excellent reducing agents. The more easily they lose the electrons, the better the reducing agents they are. Hydrochloric acid has H plus ions and chloride ions. So H plus ions and chloride ions. H plus can accept electrons to make hydrogen gas, but chloride ions can only lose electrons. In other words, 
chloride, like zinc, is going to effectively oxidize, and you can't have two oxidations. One's got to be a reduction. So the chloride ion is not really going to do anything. This is again one of those spectators. It's the hydrogen ion in HCl that will react. So will these happen? Will zinc and hydrochloric acid react together? So we go to our chart and we look up the two standard electropotentials. Well, the zinc is it's minus 0.76 for zinc ions becoming zinc. Reverse that and that becomes plus 0.76 volts. Hydrogen is zero. Whichever way you go, it's still zero. So overall, that would be plus 0.76 of a volt. And the fact it's a positive is all you need to know to say, yes, this reaction will take place. So a positive EMF means the reaction will take place. A negative EMF means it won't. In terms of this chart, again, if you identify the two half reactions, if the higher one goes this way and the lower one goes that way, then you will get a reaction because that will give you a positive result. As I said to you before, galvanic cells, are anti-clockwise reactions. Electrolytic cells are clockwise. If you remember that, you won't go far wrong. In, in the website, there will be lots of resources with lots of examples with solutions if you want plenty of practice on this.